Hi, my name is Ted Appel, and I'm with the GIM program at Boise State University here in Idaho. GIM stands for Games, Interactive Media, and Mobile Technology. In this project, I'm working with Dr. Jeffrey Johnson from the Department of Geosciences, also at Boise State University. Today, I'm going to present our project, Portable Real-Time Volcano Infrasound Auditory Display Devices. I'm going to briefly introduce the phenomenon of volcano infrasound. I will discuss the motivation for our work. I'll show the FM-based sonification method we employ and the hardware we have developed and how the device is used on volcanoes and talk about the future use and development of the device. At any given time, there are approximately 20 open vent volcanoes active in the world. These volcanoes usually produce intense infrasound airwaves that are detectable from many kilometers away. Infrasound, of course, being sound at frequencies below our hearing range. Monitoring the volcano infrasound is a useful tool when a volcano is degassing or erupting to identify mud flows, rock falls, or other activity. Many of these infrasonic sounds have strongly resonant peaks in the signal around 1 hertz, which can be used to study the structure of the volcano crater itself. It's common for researchers to use autification techniques to listen to these infrasonic signals. Speeding up a signal by 100 to 500 times and listening to the development. Here's a brief example of this technique narrated by my collaborator, Jeffrey Johnson. So this is a record from Volcano Villarica in southern Chile, which erupted in March 3rd, 2015 with a spectacular mile-high fire fountain. Uh, what we're looking at right now is a 10-hour record that's sped up by a factor of 100 times so that we can actually hear the infrasound. That means 1 hertz infrasound tone becomes 100 hertz audible tone. It starts off in the early morning with these discrete strombolian explosions, small-scale activity, nothing to be worried about. Just before 6 uh, UTC time, the strombolian popcorn-type sounds morph into continuous jetting. And this is when people start to get a little bit nervous, those of us who are watching the volcano. And shortly after 6, the paroxysm commences with a, an abrupt fire fountain reaches mile high. And within a half an hour, it's pretty much done for. Done for and over, except that on the northeast side of the volcano, there's this spectacular Lahar infrasound signal that endures for some two hours following the eruption. And that's what that high frequency tone sounds like. If you look at the waveform, you can see this decaying signal that's indicative of a large, large mud flow. <laughs> so with this technique, researchers can quickly review the geophysical record for events in the volcano, but it is not possible to do this in real time, of course. The current project came out of a desire to demonstrate to non-specialists at the site of the volcano the presence and character of these infrasonic phenomena. In many visits to volcanoes, we have struggled to show the existence of this really prominent volcanic activity that is imperceptible to human visitors. In addition to its use as an educational tool, we hope to use it ourselves to quickly assess infrasonic activity for deploying long-term sensors at the site of the volcano. This is the device we've created. We call it the VAD for Volcano Auditory Display Device. The outside of the VAD has a loudspeaker, two control knobs, and a microphone at the front. Inside a teensy microcontroller does the required signal processing. Running on this microcontroller, our sonification method is a frequency modulation based method shown here. First, the incoming live infrasonic signal from the volcano is used to modulate a sine tone that is in the audible frequency range. The base frequency of this tone is set with a knob on the VAD. The other knob on the VAD sets the index of modulation for the modulator. The result of this is a sound that glissandos up and down in frequency with a period that matches the frequency of the volcano infrasound. Next, the signal is filtered by a stop band filter centered at the carrier frequency. This functions to silence the device when infrasound is not present. So when the infrasound modulates the carrier, the output is outside this range of the attenuating filter and can be heard. This is an example of our algorithm being applied to the data from the same Villarica volcano heard earlier. In this example, a 50 Hz carrier tone and index of modulation of 20 are used. 
in this 22nd excerpt, the infrasonic tremor corresponds to the open vent degassing of the lava lake with a peak frequency of around 1 hertz. <coughs> The microcontroller in the VAD is a Teensy 3.6 with the Teensy audio breakout board attached. An electret microphone is open to the outside of the case and is preamplified by the audio breakout board. We found that this microprocessor has sufficient processing power for our DSP algorithm. A small audio amplifier seen here in blue, um, the Adafruit PAM6302 is used to amplify the uh, output signal for the speaker. This small speaker on the device is the only output display for the device. As I mentioned, the two knobs allow the user to set the carrier frequency and the index of modulation for the incoming infrasonic signal. The DSP code itself was written in the Faust audio signal processing language. This language is chosen because it compiles code for our Teensy microcontroller, as well as being platform agnostic, allowing us to use the same code on possible future versions of the device that use different microprocessor hardware. The VAT has so far been used on three different volcanoes. It was used at the Yasuo Volcano in Vanuatu to demonstrate volcano infrasound in an upcoming documentary television program. It was used at the Masaya Volcano in Nicaragua as part of a CBS Good Morning America segment, again to demonstrate the presence of infrasound. I will play a bit of this segment to see how the VAD is used in an educational context. Johnson has pioneered technology that lets us listen to lava. Volcanoes like to speak in sounds, low frequency sounds that humans can't perceive. We call it infrasound. So we developed sensors that we can deploy to listen to the volcano talk to us. Using his technology, I helped him set up a mile from the crater. We listen to the infrared sounds of Messiah. So right now we're listening to the volcano we're next to. What you're hearing right now is a sonification of the low frequency sounds that this volcano is producing. And this sound you can interpret to learn more about the volcano. Exactly. And when the tone of the sound changes over time, over the course of months, years perhaps, what we can say is that there is a changing state of activity here. So in this clip, you see that the VAD is the device that allows the host to understand the presence of the infrasonic airwaves. We were not able to do this type of immediate on-site demonstration before we made the VAD. Finally, the VAD was recently taken on a research trip to the Valrica volcano in Chile. The purpose of this trip was to deploy long-term infrasonic detectors. Here we successfully used the VAD to quickly assess locations for deployment of these long-term sensors. In the short time we've had the VAD, it has shown itself to be very useful in demonstrating volcano infrasonics in real time. Future versions of the device could use different or more powerful microprocessors. The Faust language makes it easy to compile our code for new microprocessors. The electret microphone we use, which captures signals down to approximately 1 Hz, is adequate for our use, but a differential pressure transducer could be employed that would extend this range much lower. Finally, we intend to continue using the VAD for education and outreach. We envision distributing these devices to volcano visitor centers at active volcanoes for use by visitors. The Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii would be an ideal location for this. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Very, very, very interesting um, presentation. Uh, we have already a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, first one says, any particular reason you chose 50 hertz as the carrier frequency in that example? Oh uh, yeah, that, that that's really just an aesthetic choice. Um, and on the on the device itself, you get a knob. You get to just decide what you like. And probably in that case, it was stay low to avoid super high frequencies that might become annoying. So yeah, the counter argument <laughs> here is that frequency acuity in that rate isn't really as good as you know a couple of octaves higher. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they were going for. But yeah. Um, Paul Vickers has a comments last question. 
Is this more of an edification than a sonification then? I think there was a similar comment in uh, the chat also, sonification of sounds, so kind of edification. Yeah, I struggle with with try with those definitions definitely, um, and you know I'd love to hear what other people have to say about that. Do you have a thought about that? Um, yeah, I mean I think uh, I'd like to talk about it being a sonification in the sense that it's um, it's it's turning something that's inherently inaudible into the audible range. Um, yeah. When I when I think about audifications, I just think, or just going by the definition of audification of my understanding, I was like, oh, this is just simply a time scaling of some existent data. And since we, we, are, we are manipulating the data, we're doing FM on it and so forth. Um, to me, it just fell out of that definition of audification. Um, is there, as a follow up to enhance that uh, point of sonification and set of audification, is there any plan of, um, going for a different technique or changing timbres or um, etc moving forward yes i mean i think one of the challenges is as an educational device to make the aesthetics of the sound um as pleasing as possible it has has importance uh, right now it's a bit irritating so we are experimenting with some um I guess I'm experimenting with some uh, brown noise um, uh, convolutions that make it sound a bit less glaring. Um, there's, there's various techniques we are exploring, um, but the frequency modulation technique actually has a long-standing history in the field of seismology as well. Um, so we're boring on that. Yeah, building off of the comments that you're getting, uh, in a sense, by using FM, which is a very clever way, and you're getting very interesting sounds, by the way. I, I really like the sounds and the examples you shared with us during your submission. Um, you're essentially avoiding a very key point to sonification, which is mapping. Mapping a certain parameter to an arbitrary sound. Um, so in a sense, if you are to explore different sounds, you would have to derive some sort of a mapping strategy. Is that yeah. So or not? I, I, that's a super interesting topic for me. I think people in the in the discussion are talking about this question of mapping versus insonification. Um, I, you know, and I could be just outright wrong about this, but to me, we, we are absolutely mapping, um, in the sense that we are mapping something that is some data that is inaudible to an audible sound. So to me, that is a mapping. Um, it's a simple mapping, no doubt. Um, but it's a mapping nevertheless. So, um, but of course that. I think there's a fun territory there. And that somebody else in the chat pointed out that we are, you know, we're sonifying sound. And that when I first got involved in this project, when Jeffrey came to me and started talking about it with me, I just I got confused by that. But it's taken me a while to be fine with that. You know, we're sonifying sound just like we're sonifying anything else, you know. And I think it's a really interesting thing. And I, and I just to add to that point a little bit more, um, you know, the real motive, one of the real motivations becomes why using sound in this context is because the phenomenon where we're actually trying to pull out is sound. So in some sense, there's this closer connection between the sonification and the actual phenomenon we're trying to explore here. So I think that's an interesting part of it too.